Hello everyone, Max here with Fiction Rant to do a longer form video recap of my Star Trek vs. Star Wars comparison that I did last year. It has been by far my most popular content on this channel so far and prompted a ton of discussion, so I thought I'd go back and cover some of the same material again, but in a single video which will also have the benefit of all my extra insight my audience provided. I don't claim to be the biggest fan in the world of either franchise, and there's definitely gaps in my knowledge, so... I've had a great time digging into each universe and getting feedback from so many fans on both series. Buckle up, this will be a long one. To recap a little, this comparison is between the Imperial Empire as of the Battle of Endor when it was at the height of its power, and the United Federation of Planets as of the Dominion War when it was at the height of its power, not including all the future stuff which is much less well quantified. It is important that the comparison be only between these factions at these times because as soon as you start doing an anything goes type of comparison, things get really, really silly really quickly. They also become really, really simple because basically if Trek is allowed to use anything from any faction to fight the war's universe, Q snaps his fingers and the fight is instantly over. Not much fun there. I want to start this overall comparison by pointing out a few things. In each of my Versus series that I've done, there are multiple factors considered and multiple war fronts considered. The factors are speed, weapons, defenses, numbers, unique advantages, and tactics. The war fronts are ship to ship, fleet versus fleet, soldier versus soldier, army versus army, and finally, who wins a galactic conquest scenario where neither side starts with a terrain advantage. The reason I break things down like this is not only because each of these elements contribute greatly to the overall power level of their given faction, but also because each element is not created equal. I think it's easiest to draw comparisons to real world examples, so let's look at a comparison of the HMS Impregnable, a British warship from 1841, versus the USS Missouri, a United States battleship from 1940. Let's get into the raw numbers of each of my categories. Speed. The Missouri wins since it could do 60 kph using its engines versus the impregnable which could only go as fast as the wind would allow. Weapons. The Missouri carried a variety of weaponry but for ship to ship combat or shore bombardment purposes it really only carried 9 16 inch guns and 20 5 inch guns. The Impregnable, on the other hand, carried 98 guns of various calibers, though an exact equivalence is hard since they're rated in pounds of projectile rather than diameter. In any case, in terms of numbers of guns for ship-to-ship -ship combat, the Impregnable beats the Missouri. Defenses. The Missouri had armor plating in excess of 12 inches thick. The Impregnable is made of wood. Numbers. This is a one-on-one -on -one fight, but in terms of crew, the Impregnable carried a crew of 758 men, all armed with a combination of swords, knives, and firearms. The Missouri had a complement of 1,515 men who wouldn't be armed at any given time, but there'd be a weapons locker on board should be necessary to arm them. Unique advantages. The Missouri is at about 100 years more advanced in basically every way. The Impregnable could sail using the wind without the need for additional fuel. Tactics. The Missouri would fight by keeping its distance and bombarding targets with overwhelming firepower. The Indomitable would basically do the same thing, though it would need to close the distance in order to bring its much shorter range cannons into effective range. If you look at both sides summarized in this way, it would be pretty easy to suppose that the Missouri would win most fights with its cruise complement and its speed advantages, but really if the Indomitable could close the distance and broadside the Missouri or board it before the whole 1,515 man crew could be armed, they'd be able to do a lot of damage and possibly even win. Sounds reasonable, right? No. There's absolutely no way that any matchup between these ships would end in any other way than the Indomitable being totally obliterated long before getting in range to use its own weapons. Even if they did get in range, cannonballs are useless against steel armor. Basically anybody who steps back to see this matchup knows with very little hang-ups that this is a massively lopsided fight in favor of the more modern vessel. The trick becomes trying to draw some kind of parallels between ships and crews in universes that have nothing to do with one another and wouldn't ever encounter one another. This is why the Star Trek vs. Star Wars debate has been going on for the last 50 years. But let's get to the actual comparison, shall we? I'll do a significantly abridged version of the breakdown I did during my multi-part series, but I'll try to give enough information in each category to be able to make a good comparison. First off, speed. Immediately we have to break this down into faster than light and sublight speed since in both Trek and Wars they're handled very differently and have a very different impact upon the comparison. First, the easy portion. In terms of faster than light travel, Wars is way faster than Trek. Yeah, they call it light speed, but it's pretty clear demonstrably that this is just a colloquial term, not a technical term. In Trek, the technical manuals and shows are nice enough to actually give us hard numbers on just how fast warp factors are, with warp 1 being the speed of light and warp 9 being 1516 times the speed of light. Warp 10 is infinite velocity and involves you occupying all space in the universe at the same time, but Trek has only done that once and it caused Captain Janeway to turn into a lizard. It was a weird episode. Star Wars doesn't give 
numbers on almost anything, but by doing a little back-of-the-napkin math based on episode one, where the heroes go from Naboo to Tatooine to Coruscant in about a week or maybe a month or so in actual travel time, the movie doesn't make the time frame of anything particularly clear, but in any case, if you do a little math based on that and the canon size of the Star Wars galaxy, you get that light speed is millions of times the speed of light. So, light speed is just much faster, well, hyperdrives are much faster than warp drives. A major distinction between warp drive and hyperdrives is how they actually operate, though. Warp drives are pretty much linear. You point in a direction, and then you go really, really fast in that direction, and you can adjust your course while you're at speed so you don't ram anything. You can also fire your weapons while at warp, and in fact, photon torpedoes will continue at warp if fired while you're at warp. Hyperdrives are way faster, but also a lot less user-friendly in this way. First of all, they can technically be used from anywhere that is sufficiently far away from a significant gravity well, but doing so is kind of suicidal because you'll be going in blind. Because of this, hyperspace corridors exist, which are relatively safe for travel, and they've been mapped to know that they're safe. This is why things like the Naboo trade blockade actually work, and why in Rogue One, Vader's Star Destroyer was able to jump right on top of the Rebel fleet. In any particular system, there's only a relatively small region where it's actually safe to enter or leave hyperspace, and once you're in hyperspace, you can't see where you're going, and you certainly can't dodge anything. Not that you need to most of the time. Yeah, there's no combat while in hyperspace. As for sublight speeds, I've actually had my perspective shifted a bit on this thanks to commenter at James Anderson 6769 who helpfully pointed me towards some tech manual information. Starting with the Federation again, Impulse Drive is the engine of choice on all Starfleet vessels. It works the same as any other kind of engine where the maximum velocity isn't set in stone since there's little to no resistance in space, but they have a self-imposed speed limit of one quarter the speed of light in order to avoid too many relativistic issues. How fast they actually achieve this speed varies wildly depending on the ship. Fortunately, we have the tech manual reference that James helped me find, which says that a ambassador class vessel can accelerate at a rate of 1000 G. Granted, the Ambassador class aren't exactly speed demons like the Defiant class, but for larger capital ships, I think this is a pretty good jumping off point. As for the Empire, we don't really have any speed figures on capital ships, but we do have our Megalite ratings and acceleration capabilities of fighters. A standard TIE can accelerate at 4100G and has a Megalite rating of 100, making my math nice and easy. An Imperial 2 Star Destroyer has no listed acceleration, but it does have a Megalite rating of 60. So, if we treat that like a ratio, then an Imperial 2 can accelerate at about 2460G. I personally doubt they actually can move that fast based on what we see in the movies, but for the sake of argument, we'll go with it because that's really all we have to work with. As for weapons, I go into the fan math in my dedicated video, but suffice to say I'm fairly confident that at least in terms of raw energy output, Star Trek phasers and Star Wars turbo lasers are actually fairly similar in terms of raw energy output. Raw energy output, though, is where the similarities end. So, some specs. For starters, the effective range of a turbo laser is about 1,200 kilometers. Or at least the guns on the Imperial 1 Star Destroyer Chimera had that range. After that distance, their destructive capabilities drop off dramatically. Just look at The Last Jedi, where the Dreadnought Supremacy was unable to damage the tiny resistance ships until they ran out of fuel and got closer. Last Jedi is also weird, since the turbo laser blasts followed ballistic trajectories arcing through space as if they were under the influence of gravity, but whatever. I think we can all agree that The Last Jedi wasn't the best of that Star Wars has to offer. The depictions of turbo lasers are also very artistic and not particularly accurate, at least as far as I can dig up. The main point here is that Blaster bolts should move near the speed of light despite how they're actually shown and despite Kylo Ren being able to actually stop a bolt in mid-flight. Whatever, they move pretty quick, but certainly not as fast as light speed. In addition, turbo lasers on ships are typically manually targeted by gunnery crews, further limiting their accuracy to the skill of the gunner. Really what it amounts to is that Star Wars capital ship combat is analogous to fights in Pirates of the Caribbean. You get up close alongside an enemy and just blast away at each other until one guy gets blown up. I'll also note that Star Wars doesn't really employ large-scale projectile weapons, neither cannons nor missiles. We do get to see some missiles being used, and the tech manuals reference their presence, but these are like the missile that Jango Fett used to try a blow up Obi-Wan in episode 2. They're quick and nimble with great tracking ability, but 
relatively low yield for, and they're basically for point defense purposes. The Imperials also utilize ion cannons, which come with the same range and targeting limitations as turbo lasers and are relatively non-destructive, but absolutely wreak havoc on electronics and do really heavy damage to shields. As for Star Trek, phasers come in a variety of power levels, with the most powerful being carried by space stations and the largest capital ships, such as the Galaxy and Sovereign classes. There's also more specialized varieties, such as the pulse phasers on the Defiant, which have their own pros and cons. Regarding the regular phaser beams, though, here's a few important points. For one, their effective range is in excess of 100,000 kilometers, nearly 100 times that of turbo lasers. They're also computer targeted and can hit specific spots on enemy ships while both are performing combat maneuvers. Typical favorites are target their engines or target their bridge, you know, things like that. Another important element for phasers is that they are not lasers. Granted, neither are turbo lasers, but they go about things very differently. For turbo lasers, it's pretty straightforward. They're blasters. They put a ton of energy into Tabana gas, causing it to glow, and then fling it at their enemies. They're basically no nuance beyond how much power they're packing in before firing. Phasers are particle beams, specifically nadion particles, which are capable of disintegrating molecules and damaging enemy shields or basically anything, aside from a few select materials such as neutronium. This means that their destructive capabilities are beyond just how much energy is put into each shot. In addition, they can be configured to operate at a wide range of frequencies to potentially even completely bypass shields or emit additional exotic particles as the need arises. They can also, you know, reconfigure the deflector to eject MacGuffin particles that do a bunch of stuff. Star Trek likes to insert a whole bunch of techno babble to get away with anything. I won't be considering most of that stuff for this comparison, however. Federation ships also come equipped with torpedoes, mainly photon and quantum torpedoes. In my Versus series, I pretty much neglected torpedoes entirely since there really isn't a good analog in Star Wars aside from the point defense missiles I've already mentioned, and they didn't end up influencing the outcome one way or another, so I didn't bother at the time. Well, that ends today. Photon torpedoes are antimatter warheads with configurable yield, detonation, and guidance. In fact, Multiple times throughout the shows and movies, it's been important that photon torpedoes are highly customizable, even allowing unconventional targeting methods, such as in Star Trek VI, the undiscovered country where Spock and McCoy, they brought their doctor for some reason, performed surgery on a torpedo, swapping out its regular guidance system for some gaseous anomaly scanning equipment, which then allowed the torpedo to track and hit a Klingon bird of prey that could fire while cloaked, so they were able to hit an invisible target by just tracking their exhaust. Captain Sulu in the Excelsior was then able to have his people target the explosion that that caused to pummel and destroy the enemy ship. What all this means to me is that, especially against slow-moving, non-nimble targets, photon torpedoes can hit any spot on that target, even if they have to do some crazy maneuvers on the way there. They can also be fired while at warp, which allows them to maintain warp speed to hit their target. Oh yeah, something I have yet to mention about Star Trek space combat, they can do combat while moving faster than light, unlike Star Wars. Quantum torpedoes behave basically this exact same way. They're very similar, but just scarier. Basically combine all the same properties of a regular photon torpedo with an even more destructive warhead, and you've got quantum torpedoes. On to defenses. In both Star Trek and Star Wars, the defenses are fairly nebulous in terms of their capabilities, and both sides utilize a combination of energy shields and armor to protect their vessels. In Star Wars, there's really three kinds of shielding involved. Energy shields, or ray shields, which can block energy weapons like turbo laser fire, at least to a, a point before they start getting overloaded and failing. Particle shields, which can stop projectile attacks and debris, and largely help protect against impacts from crashing fighters and against interstellar debris and such. Magnetic shields, which have basically no defensive capabilities at all and are instead used for things like just retaining atmosphere around a hangar while allowing fighters to come and go as needed. As for armor, Star Destroyers are noted as having very heavy armor, which makes them highly durable even without their shields. How durable that actually is isn't really explained at all. The best examples of the durability of Imperial shields come from the Empire Strikes Back and the Return of the Jedi. In Empire, Vader's fleet, which was trying to hunt down the Millennium Falcon, spent multiple days in an insanely dense asteroid belt, getting pummeled all the time before their shields finally started to fail and the ship started taking heavy damage from asteroid impacts. In Return of the Jedi, at the Battle of Endor, the whole Rebel fleet concentrated their firepower upon the Super Star Destroyer Executor, finally managing to take out the bridge deflector right before a crashing A-Wing pilot managed to steer his fighter directly into the bridge, 
disabling all controls for a few crucial seconds, leading it to it getting obliterated as it crashed into the second Death Star. I want to clarify what was going on here. The Executor, which was under orders from the Emperor not to attack the Rebel fleet, orders which Admiral Piet apparently was willing to ignore when he received word that the bridge deflector was down, it sat there taking the combined firepower of the entire Rebel fleet and really only got taken out as fast as it was because of a navigational issue. If it hadn't crashed, the Rebels would have been still hammering on it way longer without even destroying the vessel. All that said, Super Star Destroyers are still way tougher than normal Star Destroyers of any class, so they're absolutely capable of tanking a lot more damage. As for Imperial fighters, all fighters at that time were completely unshielded. That includes standard ties, interceptors, and bombers. There's some shielded ties that show up in the series, like the tie advance that Vader used was shielded, but it was a prototype, there's one. And TIE Defenders show up eventually, but they weren't really catching on in the Empire at the time. Basically, if you hear about a TIE Fighter, it's probably a standard TIE or an Interceptor. The Federation uses its own combination of shields and armor, and in this case, things are simultaneously more simple and more complicated, largely because Trek, in general, tries to go out of its way to explain everything, even if they have to just make up a bunch of techno babble to do so. Starting with shields, how much punishment Federation shields can actually take before failing is massively inconsistent and seems largely dependent on the needs of the plot at the time, but a few things are consistent. First, they can block basically everything, with only a few exceptions such as subspace signals, they can still communicate with their shields up, but notably they can't transport through their shields. They can also operate on a frequency system, which means if you can figure out which frequency they're operating on, you can configure your weapons accordingly and just bypass the shields entirely. Assuming you can actually configure your weapons, that is. Finally, they don't really seem to block everything that hits them. Plenty of times throughout the series, there will be a scene where some ship is getting pummeled and the tactical officer will report something like, shields down to 60%. Meanwhile, the bridge is filling with smoke and consoles are exploding and you might even get the odd hole breach. So they don't block everything, but they do mitigate a lot of damage prior to it hitting the ship. There's also more specialized kinds of shielding, such as multiphasic shielding, which was introduced in TNG as a means to protect against extreme temperatures. This then seems to have been standard across the fleet. In Descent Part 2, the episode where these new shields were introduced, the Enterprise was able to fly into the corona of a star, which heated its hull to 12,000 degrees Kelvin without deforming it or causing it to turn into slag. They then engaged their multiphasic shielding, which dropped them to a much more cozy 7,000 degrees Kelvin. This then starts to get into the capabilities of the armor on Federation ships. Remember how I was pointing out earlier that phasers don't just hit stuff with energy, they actually disintegrate molecules? Well, here's why that's important. The hulls of Federation ships are absurdly durable. For context, tungsten, the metal which has the highest melting point of any known on Earth, has a melting point of just 3653 degrees Kelvin. So, duranium has a melting point that is in excess of about four times what tungsten can handle. It's, yeah, Federation ships are made of duranium and other materials, and they can just exist comfortably at massively high temperatures and not turn into slag. What this means in terms of defenses, though, is that any kind of purely thermal weaponry, unless it is it's just absolutely insanely hot, is basically useless against Federation ships. For the sake of comparison, though, we'll assume that turbolasers do more than just heat up their targets, though if they were actually getting hot enough to melt things at that kind of temperature, they would slag their own guns. So there's an issue there, but for the sake of debate, we'll go ahead and assume that everybody's stuff works fine and can actually hurt each other. As for numbers, this is where things start getting really misleading. If you count anything that can fly around in space, the Empire has millions of ships at its disposal. This figure is really misleading, though, because that includes all fighters, capital ships, and everything. Shuttles, you know, whatever. A more realistic figure, in terms of just the larger ships, is 25,000 Star Destroyers, 50 Super Star Destroyers, and one Death Star. Unfortunately, this too is misleading. By nature, the Empire is a rule-by-fear organization, so in no conflict will it ever field that many vessels as the vast majority of them are needed to maintain order across the galaxy. So they'll be guarding important locations or terrorizing local populations on the thousands of worlds that the Empire maintains. The largest fleet we ever actually get to see is at the Battle of Endor, which involved a mere 30 Star Destroyers, one Super Star Destroyer, and the second Death Star. These all come with their own fighter and bomber complements, so they would have been accompanied by thousands of those, 
along with a variety of support vessels that weren't actually enumerated anywhere I could actually find. For Star Trek, the Federation, too, has thousands of ships spread across their territory, many of them science vessels, which are pretty poorly suited for combat, but according to fan estimates from an article I found called The Size of Starfleet, which I'll link in the description, the Federation should have between 10,000 and 70,000 ships in total. That's a huge range, but it's what I have to work with. The largest Federation deployment of ships that we ever get to see is during the Dominion War in the DS9 episode Favor the Bold, in which a fleet of 627 ships were gathered to stop the Dominion from receiving 2,500 ships as reinforcements. I think it's important to note, however, that these ships were assembled together over the course of a few days to weeks in anticipation of the battle because warp speed just isn't that fast on a cosmological scale. Sure, the Empire had a fleet that was only a fraction the size of the Federation fleet, but given how insanely fast hyperdrives are, they'd be able to quickly get reinforcements from almost anywhere fairly quickly. Granted, they probably not want to pull everybody from everywhere into a fight because doing so would destabilize the entire empire, but you get the idea. It's important to note also that the empire doesn't really seem to do much faster than light communication. In Star Trek, they can send subspace messages which can traverse the sector that they're in very, very quickly. How fast exactly? It's hard to say, but the Empire, when they want to deliver messages, or Star Wars in general, when they want to deliver messages, it's basically by courier, which is why with the Death Star plans, the Rebel Alliance didn't just beam the entire plan set into space and let everybody have them. They instead had to get basically a hard drive and then carry it, and R2 had to download it and eventually hand deliver it to the Rebellion so they could actually fight the Death Star. Yeah, information technology and communication technology in the Empire is not that great. And no, I'm not forgetting about the hologram conversation between Vader and the Emperor. This seems to be a relatively low definition conversation. So like you could have a talk with somebody, but transmitting huge amounts of data would just not be feasible with their systems. Moving on to unique advantages. The Empire doesn't really have many of those, but a couple they do have are Force users, Interdector cruisers, tons of droids, and a Death Star. Unfortunately for the Empire, as of the Battle of Endor, their total head count of Force users was a whopping two, the Emperor and Vader. All the Inquisitors were dead by this time, and none of the Emperor's hand stuff is canon anymore. Granted, both those guys are really scary, especially face to face, but they're both of relatively limited use in a space battle. Really, all that the Emperor can canonically contribute to battle directly is Sith battle meditation, which helps demoralize enemies, and Vader isn't even particularly good at that, so he's basically just a really good pilot. Sure, in Legends, Palpatine could conjure force storms that could one-shot entire fleets, but none of that's canon anymore, so it doesn't count. Interdictors are interesting. They're a specialized cruiser which has gravity well generators, which can prevent the use of hyperdrives and pull ships passing by out of hyperspace, trapping them. Unfortunately for this matchup, interdictor tech would be basically useless against warp drives. Sure, warp drives are way slower than hyperdrives, but they're also largely unaffected by all but the largest gravity wells, and generating a gravity well on that scale would just destroy the interdictor and all other nearby ships, so that'd be really counterproductive. As for droids, they are freaking everywhere in Star Wars and are typically specialized for specific jobs, which they perform quite well. The weird part about the droids is that they're often performing functions that the ship or, you know, society operating, whatever, usually you would just build those into the ship or a larger machine. Look at C-3PO. Yeah, I know he's not Empire, but he's a protocol droid, so work with me here. He's a protocol droid, so you can translate a bazillion forms of communication. That's great. Or you could just carry a pocket-sized device like a swanky smartphone, which could do the exact same thing and not even give you attitude in the process. In Solo, we also get to see that Lando, in possession of the Millennium Falcon, is using a droid to do his navigation, as opposed to just having an integrated navic computer, like what ends up happening by the end of the movie. All that to say, droids are neat, but their applications are a bit baffling. Finally, the Death Star. There's been two so far, as of the Battle of Endor, and the second was a marked upgrade on the first. Both have a, a super laser, which is capable of destroying whole planets at a range of about 2 million kilometers. The first Death Star wasn't all that accurate, having a margin of error and targeting of a few kilometers, which didn't really matter, since if you're a few kilometers off of your target but still shooting a planet, who cares? The problem with this is that it was incapable of targeting capital ships. In addition, it could only fire once every 24 hours. The second Death Star had vastly improved targeting sensors, making it capable of targeting capital ship-sized targets and featured improved recharge rates, allowing it to refire, at least at the reduced power level, every few minutes. All that said, the second Death Star was never actually completed, leaving huge pieces of it unarmored and exposed, 
and the firing arc of the super laser on either battle station was quite limited. Also of note is that neither station was actually comprehensively shielded. The second Death Star did have the shield that was originating from Endor to keep it protected, but that wasn't an integrated system in the Death Star itself. There's a reference in A New Hope to the Rebel attack squad that was going in. They flew through the magnetic shield of the Death Star. But again, that's a magnetic shield that is not a deflector shield or anything like that. If it was a particle shield, then the ships would have just run straight into it. And if it was a deflector shield, then they would have had to pass through that in order to actually use any of their weapons. In any case, the only shield that is explicitly talked about, even in the tech manuals, is a magnetic shield, which is just used for retaining atmosphere. Why they would bother retaining atmosphere around the Death Star since it had its own gravity, I have no idea, but that's all that was there. As for Federation unique advantages, there's a whole bunch, but the main three I will focus upon are really the same technology with different applications. These are transporters, replicators, and hollow projectors. All three convert matter into energy and back again, just in different ways. I'll also touch upon how the Federation isn't a monoculture, instead integrating a variety of species with their own special abilities and advantages. Transporters can transport people and objects from one location to another, typically not killing them in the process, and they have a range about 40,000 kilometers. They have a few limitations, mainly that they can only hold on to the transporter pattern of a person for a short time before the pattern starts to degrade and either the person gets hurt or killed, and they also can't be used through shields, but there's ways around that by utilizing shield frequency matching. It's not done often, but it can be done. Replicators can create or rearrange matter. They seem to do this by either burning power to create something from energy directly, or by pulling from material reserves and merely reconfiguring that material instead of creating something from nothing, which seems to be a lot more energy efficient and is used for things like waste reclamation and all that kind of stuff. They cannot make absolutely anything. If something is sufficiently complex on an atomic level, they can't make it, such as with latinum, and they can't create powered items typically. That is, you could replicate a phaser, but it wouldn't be powered. This particular bit isn't all that consistent, however, the DS9 episode Civil Defense being a notable exception where a bunch of phaser turrets were able to be replicated that could then fire upon people without needing to be charged up first. It's a notable exception, but that's what's the typical limitation. Hollow projectors are weird. They can generate three-dimensional holograms that can use precisely controlled force fields to interact with things instead of being ephemeral, necessitating the use of safeties to keep people from killing themselves. At the same time, though, they seem to be able to work in tandem with replicators, allowing the integration of edible food into the scenarios they create, among other things. Combat applications of hollow projectors have been limited so far, but they definitely have potential within the Trek universe and absolutely have been dangerous a few times, whether that was on purpose or not. Finally, the fact that the Federation isn't a human monoculture can't be ignored. Included in the Federation of Planets species are people who have superhuman strength, telepathic abilities, varying levels of intelligence, and other quirks that make them quite useful and often really powerful. The last category is tactics. Here's where the contrast becomes really stark. Suffice to say, Imperial tactics are laughably bad. Here's some of the greatest hits. Tarkin, not evacuating the first Death Star out of hubris even after a lethal vulnerability was discovered. The Death Star not deploying more of its garrison of fighters, other than Vader and a couple of his wingmen and a handful of other fighters to counter the Rebellion fighters and bombers. For the record, according to Wikipedia, it had over 7,000 fighters available, and it just didn't use them to counter the handful of Rebel pilots. Next. Admiral Ozzel having his feet leave hyperspace close enough to Hoth to be detected despite the huge amount of natural cover the debris around the planet provided, giving the Rebels a chance to first shield themselves and then escape. The captains of the three Star Destroyers chasing the Millennium Falcon, forgetting that tractor beams exist, and even come standard on their ships, instead resorting to a pincer maneuver that resulted in them actually ramming each other when Han made the brilliant navigational choice of flying down. Darth Vader also forgetting that tractor beams exist after Luke was rescued from Cloud City and the Falcon had to basically fly straight at Vader's fleet in order to get a hyperspace uh, jump point. Palpatine repeating the hubris that got Tarkin killed by not allowing his fleet to shred the rebel fleet, instead indulging his desire to smash some bugs to death with the shiny new Death Star, also resulting in his death. And that's just some of the examples from the original trilogy. People can hold up Thrawn all they want as a paragon of tactical brilliance, but in any other context, he'd merely be a top-notch commander, not a brilliant one. The whole know thy enemy thing he does and granted he does it really, really well, but that's basic military doctrine. As for the Federation, we get to see time and time again examples of brilliant tactical decisions. From the Corbomite maneuver from the second original series pilot, 
where Kirk bluffed his way out of a hopelessly outmatched encounter, to the Picard maneuver, where a younger Captain Picard aboard the Stargazer used his warp engines in a short jump to fool an enemy's sensors long enough to perform a lethal strike, to basically the entire Dominion War, where even the loss of Deep Space Nine in a hopelessly outmatched battle was turned into a victory by Starfleet by not only destroying some nigh-irreplaceable shipyard somewhere else, but also denying the Dominion the advantage that the station represented by mining the wormhole that would allow them access to reinforcements, and also using a cascade virus in the station systems to basically render it useless to them. I can go on with example after example, but the point I'm trying to make is that in the Federation, promotions are earned through excellence, so every captain and every admiral is at least competent, but often brilliant. In the Empire, most captains and admirals get where they are through nepotism, so even standard levels of competence are seen as brilliance. And worse still, the incompetent leadership feels threatened by competence, so they do whatever they can in order to quash it when they see it. Now, you may have noticed that so far I have completely neglected the ground-based side of this conflict, and you'd be totally right. So, here you go. For speed, nothing in the Imperial arsenal is as fast as a transporter. In terms of weaponry, phasers are superior to blasters in basically every way. In terms of defenses, for personnel, it's pretty moot because Federation personnel don't wear armor, even if the video games include them having personal shields and stuff. And Stormtrooper armor is so useless that it won't even stop Ewok arrows. In terms of numbers, the Empire actually believes in armies, so it has massive ones. Whereas the Federation recognizes that dedicating those kind of resources to combat assets that can be totally destroyed in an instant by an orbital attack is pretty wasteful, so their ground forces consist of ship or facility security personnel. They don't really do armies. And in terms of unique advantages, the Federation has transporters, and the Empire has what amounts to tanks, which are highly resistant, if not impervious, to small arms attacks and carry big heavy blasters. And in terms of tactics, the same factors I described before regarding space tactics apply here. Imperial tactics suck, and Federation's tactics start at competent and go up to brilliant. I mean, think about the Battle of Hoth. All the Imperial tactics were was basically just walk up and shoot stuff. That's it. I, they knew to shoot at the shield generator, which is good, but they didn't then follow up with an orbital bombardment, so it's like, oh good, we took out the shields. So what? All right, now the moment we've all been waiting for, the final showdown. Starting with 1v1 ship combat, the Federation takes this in most fights. Their weapons are way longer range, but their acceleration is way slower than Star Wars fighters, and probably significantly slower than Star Destroyers. So assuming that they didn't start the fight right next to one another, the Galaxy class would be able to get in quite a few shots before the Star Destroyer could close the gap and start dissing out punishment. And remember that phasers are super duper precise, and in order for turbo lasers to actually fire, they have to be unshielded. They can't shoot through shields, so there's a bubble of shields around the ship, which does not actually include the turbo laser so they can fire without hitting your own shields. So basically phasers would be able to shoot all the weapon emplacements on a Star Destroyer. Hopefully they'd be able to get through all of them before the Star Destroyer got on top of them and started to rain fire. TIE Fighters would of course do their best to swarm the Federation ship, but with all standard TIEs being unshielded, they'd be really easy pickings for either low yield and rapid fire phaser strikes or just transporting their pilots away. When the Star Destroyer closes the gap, the Federation ship would start getting pummeled really hard if they actually stuck around, but that's the thing. Federation captains aren't stupid, and their warp drives are capable of doing small jumps to get them out of harm's way. Sure, in the books, Grand Admiral Thrawn was able to do basically the same thing with micro-hyperspace jumps, but if we're talking the average Federation captain against the average Imperial captain, the tactical side of things definitely favors the Federation captain. Granted, what tactics someone in particular would use is relatively subjective, but I fortunately have another reason for concluding that the Federation ship would win most engagement. That is, the hangar bay on a Imperial 2 Star Destroyer is only magnetically shielded. They don't have blast doors or anything like that. This means that it retains atmosphere but contributes nothing in terms of defense. This is why it's located on the belly of the ship so that when they're going head-on attacking somebody, the hangar is out of the line of sight so you can't shoot it with line of sight weaponry like turbo lasers. So yeah, the, this is all fine and good if you're in a situation where the weapons can only shoot what they can see, but Federation sensors are really, really good, so they'd be able to not only locate every last turbo laser emplacement on the Star Destroyer right away, they'd also be able to figure out, huh, these guys don't bother shielding their bellies. And they have photon torpedoes and quantum torpedoes, which can follow non-linear paths to targets. So they'd absolutely be able to just say, oh, okay, 
target that hangar, launch a few torpedoes, have them swing underneath the ISD, and go straight into their hangar bay, absolutely gutting the entire ship with thermonuclear weaponry, which incidentally would also detonate a whole bunch of fuel reserves that they have for their TIE fighters and other equipment. Yeah, photon torpedoes would absolutely wreck Star Destroyers. As for fleet versus fleet, the same factors hold true no matter what kind of Imperial ship you're adding into the comparison. So the addition of a Super Star Destroyer wouldn't really contribute anything new aside from just more firepower. The Death Star Super Laser actually does have a range advantage over phasers, so it would probably get a kill or two before the Federation fleet just moved out of its firing arc, allowing them to just totally lay waste to the station from its blind side. And before anybody tries to claim that Palpatine and Vader could turn the tide via force shenanigans, no. No, they couldn't. As I mentioned before, in space, Vader's basically just a really good pilot, which means he's a dead man against the highly accurate and long-range Federation phasers. Legends Palpatine could probably pull some force shenanigans like a force storm out of his butt to do some damage to the Federation fleet, but none of that is canon so it doesn't count. And even if it was canon, Federation ships have been dealing with insane space storms since the show began, so they'd probably suffer some losses, but pull through for just fine overall. All that said, the Federation would absolutely suffer losses in such a fight. Sure, cat and mouse is all fine and good in one versus one fights, but even with the clumsy tactics of the Imperials of just fly up and shoot stuff, you'd eventually end up with uh, several Federation ships just getting caught out and absolutely shredded by concentrated turbo laser and ion cannon fire. In my previous comparison, I massively overestimated how fast Federation ships could accelerate. So in that particular matchup, which if you watch my Versus series that I did before, it wasn't even close because the Federation ships could always stay away from the Imperial ships and... You know, their range and stuff was always consistent with what I have now. But I, again, overestimated their acceleration capabilities. So it's a little more of an even fight now, but only a little. I also want to address the use of tractor beams by the Imperials to try and close the gap, which would actually be a good idea and allow them to actually retaliate in this fight. But basically just assuming that they even remember to use the things, which they've got a really nasty habit of not doing, I really don't think they'd actually help that much. Federation ships have a ton of experience defeating tractor beams by multiple methods, from rotating shield harmonics to disrupt the beam, to using MacGuffin particle beams to disrupt the lock, to just using pinpoint phaser hits to just destroy the tractor beam emitters. They really wouldn't help that much. In a 1v1 soldier fight, it depends on what you're talking about. Darth Vader versus basically anyone in the Federation leads to a victory for the Sith Lord without much trouble. I mean, lightsaber versus phaser is not a fair fight, and people will make the claim that, oh, but phasers move at light speed and Vader can't possibly react that fast. That would be true if being able to deflect things like blaster bolts was a question of reflexes. It's not. It's because he can actually see where the beam is going to hit before it hits. It's a precognitive ability, so he can predict where the phaser beam will be before it's even fired. He'd absolutely be able to defeat a phaser. Where it gets more interesting is security officer, so red shirt versus stormtrooper, which is ultimately really just a toss-up. Both have weapons that are absolutely capable of killing the other, and stormtrooper armor is basically useless, especially against phasers, which have been shown to just obli like take chunks out of rock walls and stuff. They can also totally vaporize people, so yeah, stormtrooper armor would not protect against that. That said, I do think that the red shirt has the advantage here because they've demonstrated such brilliant tactics as, you know, taking cover to avoid getting shot. It also seems to be just a lot easier to hit things with phasers than with blasters, partially because of the travel time, and also partially because Stormtrooper helmets apparently impair vision if Luke is to be believed from Episode 4. Clone Troopers were so much better and would probably win against Red Shirts most of the time, but they're not around anymore by the time of the Battle of Endor, and they certainly weren't Stormtroopers, so the Empire can't use them. Army versus Army depends heavily on what all is in play. If it's exclusively a Federation ground force with no infrastructure or support of any kind, versus a Imperial ground assault task force, also with no additional support, the Imperials win really easily. Again, the Federation doesn't actually field armies. It would basically be just a handful of security personnel versus thousands of stormtroopers and a bunch of AT-ATs and ATSTs and all that kind of stuff. I mean, a single Imperial to Star Destroyer carries 20 AT-ATs, 30 ATSTs, and 
a garrison of 9,700 stormtroopers. There aren't even that many people on a Federation ship, typically, unless they're, like, doing a colonial thing and carrying a ton of people just because. Yeah, the Federation would not stand a chance against that kind of army. If, however, both sides are allowed support, this becomes a much more complicated question. This would mean that whichever side wins an orbital battle gets orbital support. And as I've already discussed, the Federation usually wins that fight. Suddenly, this turns from a fight between a handful of security officers and a giant Imperial army into some security officers basically just having a picnic while ships in orbit rain fire and torpedo fire from the sky onto the Imperial troops in armor, basically totally annihilating all of them that aren't transported away into holding cells, since all the Imperial walkers and other tank-like things that we've seen have been armored, not shielded, meaning that transporters can nab everyone that they want. Even if the AT-ATs or whatever type of armor were shielded, phaser strikes would still take them out pretty easily. I mean, the phasers on a starship are really powerful. If the Imperials win the orbital fight, Things really don't change much for the Federation ground forces. They go from really outnumbered and outgunned to even more outnumbered and outgunned. They would get totally blown up. But yeah, to try to keep things relatively fair, I'm going to give army versus army to the Imperials anyway, since considering every matchup in a vacuum seems to be the only way to actually keep this fair. As soon as we start being like, well, what if they were supported by such and such? That's gets really, really complicated and nasty. Finally, the Galactic Conquest question. I'll clarify that this is a scenario that takes years and years involving fleets of Federation Imperial ships starting on opposite sides of a galaxy where all their tech and everything works, so there's hyperspace lanes that are established and everything, and basically just follow video game rules where they can build as many ships as they can get resources for and crew them with no problems. Here's how I see this playing out. Both sides will rapidly colonize their corners of the galaxy. The Imperials just have massive industry, so they just brute force everything. They can drop entire garrisons as like prefab structures and set up mines and all that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, the Federation doesn't have as many personnel, but they're really good at like making really efficient systems that are highly automated so they'd be able to set up their mines for everything. Both sides have specific resources that are relatively scarce. For the Imperials, it's hypermatter. For the Federation, it's dilithium and antimatter, which antimatter they can just synthesize, but dilithium they have to mine. The limiting factor then becomes how fast can they actually spread? The Imperials absolutely would be able to spread faster because hyperdrive is just really, really fast. Like the Federation would be able to spread to a immediate region basically at the same rate because it's a short hop like you're talking a difference of a few minutes but as the territory grows warp drive hits its limitations in terms of speed so they'd slow down their exploration much sooner than the imperials would this means that first contact will occur when the first imperial scout stumbles into federation territory by mistake keep in mind imperial sensors suck they can't even detect ships that are in hyperspace they can detect when they're about to come out of hyperspace because there's this huge energy surge but they can't actually detect them in hyperspace it's a big plot element in the sequel trilogy so an imperial scout will accidentally discover federation territory first and unless a federation ship is just happening to be really really nearby and really quick with a tractor beam i don't think that they'd actually be able to stop the scout from getting away but at the same time they'd absolutely no matter where they were in the system they'd detect that they'd been discovered by something that they can move at transwarp level speeds this would soon prompt the first major conflict between the two sides the federation would have an early warning of an incoming imperial fleet to their observatories just like with every borg invasion and would assemble a fleet to meet the imperial fleet when it arrived the fight would quickly turn into a game of cat and mouse as federation ships would be surprised at just how fast the imperial ships can move but they'd also gain a ton of tactical information on the configuration shield strength weapon strength and shield distribution of the imperial ships the federation would absolutely take really nasty losses in this initial conflict but I still think they would inflict more losses upon the Imperials, forcing them to retreat with all their fighters either destroyed or unmanned, just, you know, drifting in space. And a bunch of their Star Destroyers will be completely destroyed outright by torpedoes as soon as the Federation figures out that particular weakness. You know, a single torpedo being able to detonate all of your fuel reserves, you just one-shot the thing. However, there will also be other Star Destroyers that are disabled in a more conventional manner, just from concentrated fire. They won't be destroyed outright, but they will be crippled, you know, engines not being able to go anywhere, that kind of thing. At this point, Federation engineers would be able to get a hold of all the Imperial tech that they would ever want. 
mainly the hyperdrive. And once they have that, the biggest Imperial advantage is gone and the war is over. Federation ships outfitted with hyperdrives would be totally unstoppable for the Empire. Starfleet would be able to raid anywhere in the Empire with a combination of hyperdrives and warp drives allowing them to come at Imperial targets from any angle, so even blockades wouldn't help, and they'd be able to engage all those Imperial targets at 100 times the maximum effective range of Imperial weaponry, and yeah, there would be very little that the Imperials could do to stop them. I will note that in terms of installing hyperdrives on their ships, it would probably be really, really simple to at least grab hyperdrives off Imperial ships and just stick them into Federation ships. I mean, in Episode 1, the Royal Naboo ship was damaged to the point where they needed a new hyperdrive, so they pick one up in a junkyard, drag it across a desert, and just slot it in, and it works. Clearly, this is a fairly accessible technology, even if it's one that the Federation hasn't discovered on their own yet. The only way that I can see the Imperials being able to maintain a long-lasting, glorious empire, you know, whatever, would basically be just never engage the Federation in any way. Don't try to fight them, don't try to negotiate with them, nothing. With the difference in faster than light speed, the Empire would be able to spread to like 60 to 80% of the galaxy, totally uncontested, but that corner occupied by the Federation would be totally unbeatable, and introducing the Federation to hyperdrive tech would be the downfall of the entire Empire. Even if the Empire started jumping in the Death Star and trying to take out planets, yeah, they'd probably get a couple, but the Federation would absolutely figure out, oh, this thing is scary, let's take it out, and they'd absolutely be able to set up garrisons at sensitive locations, or even just be able to track hyperspace and detect where the Death Star is showing up next, and absolutely would be able to take it out, no problem. As I mentioned before, stay out of the firing arc of the super laser, and you're good. But let's say for the sake of argument that the Imperials managed to win an early engagement by some miracle and capture a Federation ship. Now they'd have access to all the Federation tech, right? Now that you can close that range gap and all that. Maybe eventually, but not in time to affect the outcome of the war significantly. You've got to understand, the Empire barely innovates. And its hierarchy is built almost entirely upon nepotism, which encourages the sabotaging of anyone who actually attempts to earn anything by merit, because it highlights just how incompetent the people who got their jobs by knowing somebody really are. Give a system like that a shiny new ship full of earth-shattering new technology from transporters to phasers to photon torpedoes and replicators, and the first thing that an aspiring Admiral or Moff would do is try to gain complete control of it while they slowly pecked away at unlocking its secrets. If he was in a mood to actually step in and do the wise thing instead of encouraging infighting the way that he usually does, Palpatine would step in, take the ship, hand it over to more qualified research people, but even they would be at a total loss. The level of tech difference is absolutely staggering for most of this stuff. Whereas with a hyperdrive, which you can literally drag across a desert from a junkyard and slap it into your ship and you're good to go, reverse engineering Federation tech for the Imperials would be the equivalent of dropping off an F-22 Raptor to somebody in World War II. Sure, it would look somewhat familiar. I mean, this is a full metal body aircraft. They had those in World War II, but vectored thrust jet engines, radar absorbing paint, transistors, fly-by-wire avionics, not to mention the guidance systems on their missiles and such, the radar that's integrated, the multi-targeting, all that tech. The tech gap would be so massive that the thing would just be a curiosity for years until a ton of other technological development could be done first. The framework for even comprehending the technology simply wouldn't be there yet. And the same would be the case for the Imperial engineers and scientists. Take the Clone Wars, for example. It was stated by Lama Su in Attack of the Clones that their clone troopers were far superior to droids and that only modifications to the clones that they made from Jango Fett was that they changed them to grow faster and be more docile so you could actually give them orders. Meanwhile, in the Star Trek universe, Khan... He was engineered to be a super genius with superhuman strength about three to four hundred years before the series even takes place. Yeah, he was born during the 90s. What this means is that pre-space civilization humans were making way better clones than the Kaminoans centuries before the Federation even existed. And the Kaminoans are supposed to be really good at this. Granted, in the extended canon, they do a bunch of genetic engineering on themselves and their whole races like that. But in terms of just, hey, we made you a super soldier, they didn't make super soldiers. They just took somebody who was pretty good and made a bunch of copies of him. As I've mentioned before, the one advantage that the Imperials really have is hyperdrives. 
and that tech has gone basically unchanged for thousands of years. Ship designs have changed, but most of that is just reconfigurations of the same old tech that's been around, again, for thousands of years. Nothing significant has actually been invented in the Star Wars universe in millennia, and to me, that means that even if by some miracle the Imperials could actually get a hold of Federation tech, they simply wouldn't know what to do with it, and it would confer no advantage whatsoever in a war. And that's even assuming that the Federation was stupid enough to not, you know, self-destruct their ships should they come under capture. The Federation wins a galactic pro conflict, no problem. They, again, might lose a couple planets to Death Star attacks, but they'd absolutely be able to destroy that in a fleet battle fairly early in the conflict, and it simply wouldn't be feasible for the Empire to just keep building them. All right, this has been a very long video. I don't know when I'll do another one in this format again, uh, if ever, but it's been fun to put all my thoughts and conclusions into this single video, so I hope you all enjoy it. Again, thank you so much to all my commenters for pointing out things that I missed during my initial series. Let me know in the comments of this section if you agree or disagree, or if you think that Vader would crush the whole Federation with his mind. Haha, <laughs> fanboys. And until next time, live long and prosper, and may the Force be with you.